podcast. Today I'm here to meet hard man, cage fighter and former convict Tony Gooch. Tony has turned his life around and now is an inspirational fella and this is his story. Let's go in and surprise him. This podcast takes me to Reading, to the Active 8 gym, to meet hard man Tony Gooch. Tony is well known in the prison system, not just for his reputation, but for keeping the peace between the screws and the prisoners. Tony's name came into the TV screens on Britain Behind Bars, going inside the walls of six prisons to offer a sharp insight into the harsh realities of life behind bars today for thousands of inmates and staff. How are you, my brother? Finally. Nice to meet you, bud. It's getting cracked in mate. We're good to go. Good to go. Welcome, Tony Gooch. Pleasure to have you. Cheers, mate. It's been a lot. Of, we've been planning this interview for yeah, a long it's time. Yeah, a long time coming. It's been so busy, but uh, we've got here now. Mate, you have some story. And one thing I will say, and I said this to, to to John a couple of weeks ago, when I read up about you with the reputation as a hard man and stuff, looks can be so deceiving. Yeah. Because yeah. You, to, I mean, when, usually when I see you, you look like a businessman. Yeah. But mate, you have a reputation. Yeah. Where did you grow up? I grew up, um, initially I grew up in a place called Shepparton, um, which is in uh, Surrey, Middlesex. Um, and I was there till I was about 11, and then I moved to Sunbury on Thames, which is basically next to Felton. Yeah. So you're kind of on the border in West London. Uh, and that was where the reputation started to build, it started to grow. Um, but we're saying this just off camera, the, the, the reputation never come. Um, on purpose, yeah. it was just it was a byproduct of what I was doing. It's how other people perceive you as an individual. Um, me myself, I don't think I'm a bad person. I don't think I'm a horrible person. Um, but at the same time, I'm not a mug. So uh, that's the way I was brought up. Um, so yeah, and never set out to get the reputation. Just ended up with it. Where do you think that the toughness came from, Tony? Did you have like anybody in your family that was kind of a hard man? No, I mean my uncles and everyone's. The, the, the men within my family have always um, had various reputations for doing different things, but I mean, with me, I, I'm, you're a product of your environment. Yeah. The, depending, if I'd have hung around with Eton fucking school kids, no doubt I'd have gone on a completely different route, but I didn't. I hung around with fucking thugs. Yeah. So, and I mean, the, the beginning of the criminal career, it wasn't ever for financial gain. It was purely because we was fucking bored. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you come out your house, everyone meets up. We didn't like standing outside a fucking shop, giving it the big one. We, we wanted excitement. So the only way to get that excitement was to create it. So you go and chore cars, you ram them into each other, you chore bikes, you go over the field on them. That's how it started. And then when I got sent to uh, Young Offenders for the first time, all of a sudden, you got people saying, well, I'll give you money for that car. And you're like, I'll fucking rip all them cars off. I could have fucking had all this money. I've been doing it all this time. And now it then takes a different direction because now it becomes a financial gain. And that's where the criminal enterprise starts to spread. And again, it's not something you set out to do. No. Do you know what I mean? It's just the journey you end up going on. Do you ever think that, were you, were you bothered about going to prison and stuff when you were younger at all or not? Yeah, of course. Listen, anyone, the first time you go to prison, anyone that said, oh, you're talking bullets. The first, I can remember being in that court and you sort of, where you get away with so many things, because the amount of times, it was like the youth court at Staines Magistrates Court was on a Wednesday. Every fucking Wednesday I was there, my mum hated it, because every fucking Wednesday she'd have to have day off work and I'd have to go to court. And it's like, you, you go into the court and they're like, right, we're gonna give you probation for this, we're gonna give you community service, we're gonna give you rehabilitation, we're gonna give you this. So you sort of get it in your head that it's never gonna happen. And then all of a sudden, you do that one offence, and they go, look, we've had enough of this. And all of a sudden, the shock, because when I went in, it was for actually, um, it was driving offences. I think I was on my, like, my sixth ban for driving, and I, I weren't even fucking 17 yet. 
So I banned before I could even have a license. So in my head, I'm thinking, I'm going to go in, they'll ban me, I'll fuck off, that'll be the end of it. And I went in there and they said, look, we're going to give you 12 months. And I was like, it dawns on you then, until you've experienced prison, you don't know what to expect. And that is the biggest fear with prison. It's thinking about what it's going to yeah, be like. You don't know what, you're going to the dark, you're going to the exactly. unexpected, isn't you, it? You don't know, you've heard the, st the stories, you, you've heard what's Watch to movies expect. and stuff exactly, as well, you think. but until you physically experience it yourself, I mean, is prison hard? No, I don't think it is. I think it's as hard as you make it, mate. It's, as, it, uh, it, it's completely dependent on the kind of person yeah. you are. Like you are, you're either a lion or you're a fucking yeah. shit. If you go in there and you're going to get made to look vulnerable and you know, have the piss taken out of you, you ain't going to have a good ride of it. If you go in there and stand your ground, you get on with everyone, don't cause yourself a fucking nuisance, you'll get through your sentence. Yeah. But the difference between a young offenders and an adult's jail is fucking million miles apart because in a young offenders, everyone's got a reputation, everyone's a fucking gangster, everyone's a millionaire. So you're, you're thrown into a cauldron of other people like you. And on the outside, if you're in your little group and you're known as the nutty one, you're the nutty one out of the group. But yeah. now you're in a group where everyone's a fucking nut. <laughs> yeah. So, and it suddenly dawns on you that you're a very small fish in a big pond. So, when I went in, the, the expectations weren't as bad as what I first expected. I was expecting it to be a lot worse. But the thing I struggled with was having everything taken away. So your family, your, your phone, you can't just pick up the phone and ring someone, your girlfriend, your mum, your dad, what you're so used to growing up, your computers and things like that. The ability just to think, I'm gonna go out for a bit because I'm bored. Yeah. And it's having that taken away from you that is the hardest thing. Well, I found the hardest thing to cope with. Yeah. Do you think, John, you know when you're talking about when you're going to prison and you, you create this picture in your head of what it's supposed to be like, you're creating your own anxiety. Of course you are, yeah. And you know, you see with like mental health and stuff and anxiety, did, did you ever suffer as a child with mental health or was it later in life that you, you no, started so, getting anxiety and stuff? So the, 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 I mean, I used to get anxiety a lot worse than I do now because I've learned yeah. to control it. So obviously the gym, is brilliant for anxiety. With me, it's a build up of energy. So, when I was a kid, I used to have full blown seizures where I would be completely unconscious and I was told, you're epileptic. So I got put on these things called Epilim 500s. I was taking them, but I was still fitting and I couldn't work out why. So then I get told I've got ADHD, so then I get put on medication for that and I'm really hyperactive. But again, nothing seemed to, to curb the condition in itself. So it was kind of like, oh, what the fuck is it? Um, and like I said, I went to Great Ormond Street Hospital as a, as a young kid and they put all the sticker things on your head and they do a reading and it came back, I had this condition, uh, abnormal electronic charges of the brain, which basically meant my brain was constantly firing, which in itself then made me hyperactive. So there, at the time, there's, there, there wasn't really a lot known about the condition. There's not a great deal known about it now. They don't know why it happens. They think it's sort of genetic or it's in the DNA, but I thought I sort of had to learn to cope with it myself. Um, so if I take myself away from being busy, that's when I start to have problems. Yeah. Um, normal everyday worries that don't really affect me. But if I'm isolated on my own, I mean the worst thing I ever done, I moved into a property on my own. Worst fucking thing I could have done. Because even though I'm going to work, I'm going home and then I'm on my own. Yeah. You've only got yourself to keep your company and that's when the demons start to come out. Yeah. And it's very easy to transform them demons it, then into bad energy and you want to go out, you want to fight, you want to go out yeah, and do yeah. something about you saying, do you know what I mean? So for me, it's, it's putting myself around sensible people, positive people. I'm a firm believer, surround yourself with positive people, yeah. positive things happen. And that proof is in the pudding in the last two years. Anyone that has been negative, I've cut out of my life like a cancer because they're no good. They're no good for you. They're only going to drag you down or they're only going to lead you to do something fucking stupid. And I don't need that in my life anymore. So now I'm, I'm progressing, I'm moving forward and I'm coping really well. Books can be deceiving with Tony. But trust me, underestimate this man at your peril and you'll find he's not as gentle as he looks. Tony has a fearsome reputation down the south of England and he was definitely a product of his environment, brought up around gang life and crime. It was a guarantee that that was the road Tony would take.
totally believe in all that laws of attraction me Tom, I don't know whether you do yeah. sending your positive affirmations into the oh, universe 100% I mean I'm constantly thinking about where I want certain areas of my life to go but what I won't do there is sit in there and go oh it's not going to work yeah. oh that's going to flop that's a fucking flop. pop out straight away you know what I mean you've got to stay positive it, the thing is is that a lot of people nowadays especially with the kids nowadays they expect everything to come to them they think they're just gonna wake up one morning and there's a Range Rover and a Land Rover with a little blonde bird sitting in the passenger seat waiting for them. Yeah. You've, got, you've got to get off your fucking ass and go and get it. So, if you're sitting in your house and you're getting off your nut or you're smoking your fucking weed, you ain't gonna go nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Like, but trying to convey that to these kids is very difficult because the groups, as I say, product of your environment. And the trend with a lot of kids now is, well, we'll go around my mate's house and smoke weed yeah, and yeah, play yeah. the computer. It ain't gonna get you nowhere. Yeah. It, it's separating yourself from that, knowing your worth, realizing your capabilities, and moving forward with your life. Everyone wants to get rich, but they don't want to work hard. Of course they don't. I mean, it, it, it's that typical thing. And I mean, sort of possessions now seem to be everything to 100%. people. 100%. It's like, I've got a Range Rover, and it's like, they drive down the road in their Range Rover, absolutely convinced in their head that everyone's driving past them going, look at that gaze <laughs> yeah. No one gives a fuck. No one, whether you're in a Mini Cooper or a Ferrari, no one cares. Like, it doesn't affect anyone else's life. It's just your mental state. So, for me, I would rather now, I don't, I don't, I don't need a nice car. I don't need a fucking Rolex. What I want is to be successful. 100%. So, those things that they're striving for are a byproduct of success. Yeah. So, first become successful, first get the money in the bank, then you can treat yourself. Yeah. But a lot of the kids now, they're doing it the other way around. Now it's like, I've got to be seen in a brand new tracksuit. I've got to be seen with a nice bird. I've got to be seen in a nice car. It's all Instagram it's and creating fucking, in this yeah. image. That it, it, it's just fucking ludicrous. Look, do, you, do you find that, Tony, with social media, it's the worst for showing a fake lifestyle? <laughs> I mean, it, it's unreal. I mean, a lot of the, um, I mean, I can't get my head around this thing at the minute. I mean, I, I've been watching a lot of this stuff on feminism um, and it fucking intrigues me because on one hand, I can see a group of women in London going, you don't treat women like this. We deserve better. We can wear what we want. I'm in full agreement with you. Yeah. you you're no different to a man. You can do whatever you want. But if you're gonna go on TikTok, in a fucking set of knickers, shaking your ass all over the gaff, yeah. and then all of a sudden, someone fucking cops hold you outside the house. How's that fucking mindful? And again, they'll yeah. turn around and say, oh, well, we, we don't ask for that. But listen, if you act a certain way, you draw attention to yourself. 100%. So, for me, it's, it's kind of like, it's a bit of a rib roll at the minute with, um, with all of that. I mean, I, don't, I can see the girl's perception of, yeah, you look pretty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've got full right to flaunt it on, on, on the internet and do what you're doing. But the bad thing about it is, is that it's not those girls that get targeted. No, no. So you've got these fucking scumbags that will sit and watch these beautiful women. Now they can't get to them. So what they do is they'll go down the nightclub and all of a sudden they see another little bird and they're like, well, she's all right, I'll spark her drink. Do you know what I mean? So for me, it's that. feeding that appetite in these men. Yeah. Um, and I think it's like dangling a carrot in front of a fucking, 100%. in a goat, so. I mean, I've seen me on Facebook, I mean, I've seen birds like, leaving the tits out. But then you get guys commenting underneath, making sleazy comments, and then the birds are yeah. why you're treating them like a slut and blocking them. So I'm like, you, well, just, you fucking nearly got your tits out. Well, it's the age old thing, isn't it? I mean, a geezer can sleep with 100 birds, and he's a geezer. But a bird sleeps with 10 geezers, she's slack. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. So you have to weigh it up. I do see both, both sides of the yeah. argument. But um, I think girls need to be, a lot, especially nowadays. Um, I mean, I'm absolutely disgusted. I mean, we're working on a program at the minute to, um, to raise awareness in the government about social media platforms. Yeah. So I've got an 11-year-old daughter, um, and then you would have heard of Roblox, and yeah, there's yeah. another one called Among Us at the minute, yeah. and all of these different children's sites. So not forgetting, these are built for children. They're not built for adults, they're built for yeah. children. So you can go into these sites without showing any identification whatsoever. You can go into the chat rooms, and Ru Ruby called me and she said, oh, can you, can you come have a look on, this, on my phone? So I went up there and the messages are, what character are you in Among Us, blah, blah, blah. And then it was like, I'm in my bed, what colour eyes have you got? Are your mum and dad there? That ain't a child. No, no. That's a fucking geezer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So immediately you take them off of it, you're not allowed. But then you're penalising a child now that is playing the game yeah. that she's enjoying because some fucking nonsense on there trying to take advantage of your child. So we're, we're trying to launch this initiative now where if you're launching a new app in the UK or a website or anything that children can access, 
you have to, it's compulsory, yeah. to show identification. Yeah. If the child's under the age of 16, the mum or the dad or a sibling has to show their ID. So every single user is then accountable. Do you not think, Tom, with something like that, do you not think if a child is going to go on social media, do you not think it should be attached to maybe the parents as well, where anything that comes through the parents can see I mean, it? there are certain programmes that you can get that mirror your child's phone to your phone and it'll yeah. give you an alert. If, but the, the problem is, is that the way technology is moving forward at such a fast pace, yeah. it's impossible to keep up with it. Um, and these kids, it's not like when I first got a mobile phone. I mean, when I got them, they just had numbers on. You didn't even have a fucking screen. So now these kids are growing up learning the technology. So, I mean, I've got a, a six, seven year old. They can go on a phone change oh, settings yeah. and oh, do all yeah, with yeah, it yeah, yeah. without even fucking thinking yeah. about it. Whereas for me, I've got to sit down and think, what do I go into? I'll go on YouTube and find out how to yeah. do it. So they're always going to find a way to misuse something. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is, is having these arseholes in there that are being allowed to put themselves in that position to, to mistreat the children. Yeah. And that to me is unacceptable. Um, especially in that we're meant to be one of the most advanced nations on the fucking planet. But yet, yeah, I've got fucking some 40 year old nudge trying to talk to yeah. each other. So something needs to be done. I don't know whether you agree with me on this, Tom. And I mean, I, for me, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think the government are so corrupt. And the, especially, I, I really do, yeah. that, especially when it comes to pedophilia and, and child trafficking and stuff. I well, think listen, it's, a lot it's, covered up, mate. it's one of them. One of them. I mean, no matter what you get, what areas—business, um, family—there's there, always a form of corruption. Yeah, um, it's part and parcel of life. You're always going to get someone that wants to give. You're always going to get a greedy cunt. It's, it, it's just life. Yeah, yeah. So for me, the decisions that the government are making now, and this is again something we're really trying to highlight, is that they don't want to listen to people like me because the attitude of the top 5% of the UK that live in the big houses and have got the massive salaries look down at people like me and we oh, no, we won't listen to him. We don't, we don't, we don't, no, 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 no. They, they, they're not fucking interested. And in a speech that I'm preparing, I'm doing um, a, a half an hour speech at the, uh, the National Commission of Childcare in Derby in September. Um, and in this speech, we go back to the Second World War. Um, and you've heard of Alan Turing, the code breaker yeah. from Bletchley Park. Now, he was the top end of the scale. He was one of the most intelligent people in his field. And he was put into a position to break the code to give us vital intelligence to beat Germany in the Second World War. Now, on the flip side, there was an 18-year-old kid called Alan in Germany that was German. And he decided he didn't agree with what Germany was doing. So he was going to back Britain all the way. And he was going to give secret information about mm. Germans, um, their like, what weapons they were using, enemy positions. And it actually led to us winning the D-Day landings. Now, the reason that worked so well is that the government were the central database. They were receiving information from the ground and from their top people. And once they gathered all that information, they made a very good decision with the information they had. The position we're in now is the government only seem to be listening to the top half and no 100%. longer the bottom half. Yeah. So now what happens is you're basing all of your decisions, the programs you're gonna start up for, for young offenders, for sexual abusers, but you're only basing it on half of the information. Don't, it's not logical. You need all the information to make the best decision possible. And this is what I, I, I need to highlight, and this is what I'm gonna bring up at the speech that I think is broken down. You never find torn that with this new venture that you're going and helping kids, women, um, former criminals and stuff. You never find that being a prison, I think it's it's affected you a little bit by being a being a like being a convict in prison. I mean I've had this conversation before and you get a lot of people coming out, I can't get a job, I'll yeah. be it's bullshit, it's absolute fucking bullshit. Do you think the government looked down on you? Do you think you fight do you think they're looking down on you because you've been to prison or not? Of course they do, of course they do. I mean, once you become a criminal and you've got a criminal record, you are classed as lower than a normal citizen. Yeah. Because you are. I mean, look at it fairly, you are. They haven't got a criminal record, you have. I mean, the only problem with employment as such is that if someone's got an application on a table and you've got a geezer with no criminal record and a geezer with a criminal record, yeah, yeah. you're always going to go, because you, you, you want your business to be successful, so yeah. they're not going to gamble. But the problem stems, I think, from if you're, if you're going to send people to prison because they've done wrong, which you have to agree with. For certain offences, if you're a, a danger to yourself or a risk to the public, then yes, something has to be done about you. You can't be left to free run about because you're just going to continue to commit worse offences. But the problem is, is if you're going to take the step to put their liberty away and then not rehabilitate them, how have you solved the fucking problem? Yeah. 
You're putting them in prison, sweet. That, well, I agree with that, yeah? yeah? If you've gone out and you fucking weighed someone in and knocked their teeth out and done all this and you're on a GBH charge, you, you're going to prison. There ain't no two ways about it. But the problem with me is you're now going to let that person out of prison and you go to probation. What, 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 what's he doing in probation? You sit there talking to some dinlo, <laughs> going, don't do anything wrong for an hour. You go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, and then you're out the door. So probation ain't worth a fucking wait. So yeah. that person is now in the exact same position than when they committed the offence. So it's like a, an evolving circle. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're not going to help them, then what's the point in fucking banging them up? You might as well just leave them out. I think this is the problem why a lot of people re-offend. You've got 75% of young offenders re-offend and go back to prison within one year of release. Yeah. That is unacceptable. If you compare that to the Netherlands, 30%. Why is it 30% in the Netherlands and 75% here? The reason being is that they have the, the foresight to give them the reform once they're released. Yeah. So in this country, you're released from prison. They open the gate and they say, tell her. In the Netherlands, about four months before you're released, they put you into a housing unit. They give you all of the, the social skills you need to pay your bills. They give you like a little apartment with all the amenities. So they're kind of teaching you how to live and how to survive yeah. on your own, and then they release you out. And the effect is clear to see, the results speak for themselves. But yet, again, one of the most advanced countries on the planet, and we can't fucking work it out. Yeah. And then I'm sitting here, an ex-criminal, I can see it, but these fucking intelligent people can't. And that, that's what's making me angry. If I can see it, and everyone else in my position can see it, why can't you see it? And then it comes back to what you're saying, corruption. Yeah. Because it's almost getting to the stage now of, you know about it, but you ain't fucking fixing it. And I'd love to know the reasons why. Yeah. Do you find, John, for yourself personally, that, that prison changed you as a man? No, prison, prison doesn't change. I think, as a criminal, it makes you worse. Yeah. But the reason it makes you worse is not behavioural-wise, it's because of all of the contacts you make within the prison system. That it is the college of crime. Yeah. That, that is what prison is. Um, and this is why I'm so against first time young offenders. And don't get me wrong, even when I went to young offenders, they tried lots of alternatives to custody before they actually banged me up. But for me, you never gave me that support. You never gave me that one on one support to try and work out why I was offended. It, it, it wasn't addressed as such on an individual basis. And this is the problem with a lot of the prison programs now. Like they'll say, you've got to go and do a, an anger management course. Yeah. Let me tell you about this anger management course. And the, for the people that was in the prison with me at the time, it was, they was absolutely in hysterics. So I get told, you've got to do this anger management course, Mr. Gooch. said, not a problem, I'll go and do it. So I think it's HMP Hyde so I goes into this room and I'm sitting there and I've already got the mindset, I don't want to fucking be here. This is bollocks. That's my mindset before I've even got in the room. So already I'm not interested in what's going to take place. I've then got a woman standing up in front of me saying, everyone stand up and put your arms out. And I'm watching all these people so I'm thinking, what the fuck's going on? She went, now pretend you're going to hug a tree. That was it. The chair went up, <laughs> fucking arms gone, mate. I was like, what the fuck? I said, and you think this is going to help me and rehabilitate me? I said, Everything needs to be catered to the individual. Everyone's different. Yeah. Everyone's got different problems. Everyone's got different backgrounds. So if you're not going to work with people on an individual basis, you're never going to succeed. 100%. Do you know, do you, do you, would you agree with me, Tom, that if you've got serious mental health problems and you're in prison, prison's bringing the worst out of you? Oh, 100%. Listen, I'm watching officers. I'm, I've got kids. And I say kids because there's this loophole in, in the legal system that if you are not a convicted young offender, yeah. you can be housed in a remand prison with adults. So you are taking a child that's 18, 19, 17, and putting them in a Monty fucking adult prison yeah. with established criminals. And you think that prison sentence is going to help that child? Like, it's, fu it's yeah. fucking ludicrous. Now, you put people with mental health problems involved. Now, a lot of people with mental health problems can go one or two ways. They can either address the issues that they've got if they're in that place in their life where they're ready to address the problems and try and get help, or they go the other way, they try and block it out. The way they block it out in prison is through bad behaviour or taking drugs. The spice ep uh, epidemic that is now sweeping across Massive, every single yeah. prison in the fucking UK it's heartbreaking. I'm yeah. watching people throw up and swim in it, 100%. laughing their head off. And it's like, that is someone's child. And I'm watching officers go, hey, look at this cunt. And it's like, yeah. you, you've got a duty of care over that prisoner. Yeah. He's done wrong, he's doing his time. That's his punishment. And they're standing there laughing yeah. at him. You've got fucking screws bringing drugs in, man. Of course you have. I mean, I've, I know lads in prison now, I've got a couple of friends in there now, and they take drugs. 
just to pass the time, mate, but it's boring. There's nothing to do in there. No. And with the COVID, I mean, who the fuck would want to be in prison at the moment? No. They, I think they've only just started getting visits and things and yeah. their gym back and things like that. It's, and that in itself is like, a, it, it's mentally draining. I remember in, um, uh, what was it, High Point, High Point in uh, Norwich, I got caught having uh, a relationship with a female officer. And I went to the block and because it was one of their own, and it's at least like the police force, you're at a gather, they want to fucking kill you. And it's the same in the prison system. Yeah. If you get one of their own into the shit, they, they want to get their pound of flesh. Um, and I've done 17 weeks in segregation on my own, in a room, with fuck all in it but a polystyrene table. I was on a four man unlock, so they was literally opening the door and sliding my food in and shutting yeah. the door. I have got nothing. Now, I don't give a fuck how hard you are. I don't, you can be the toughest geezer in the world. Try and sit in your broom cupboard under your stairs for fucking 17 weeks on your own. Long time, With yeah. no human contact, no nothing. And it's, it, it, it starts to get that to you. You, start, it, you start to break. Do you know what I mean? It breaks you as a human being because you're being treated like an animal. And then on the flip side of that, I get released. I've got moved from there to Wayland. I come out of Wayland and it's like, now be good. Fuck you. Lock me in a fucking room for 17 weeks. Think I'm going to be good. Fuck off. Like, there, there's no logical sense to the rehabilitation programs in this country. I think that's part of the process in prison that sometimes they do it on purpose just to fuck your head up. Of course they do. They're not fucking stupid. Listen, them screws are going home every day. The second they walk out them gates, they ain't thinking about you. Yeah. But from the second they walk in their gates, they think, ah, oh, remember Clive? We're fucking up today. Yeah. That's what they're doing. That's the mentality. It's no different from being at school and being bullied. Do you know what I mean? If you, if you do something to them, they will get you back. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's as simple as that. Do you not think they should bring like boxing? Do you not think they should bring some sort of physical activity into prisons, like boxing classes? So this this will make you stuff. laugh, right? So back in the olden days, you used to get boxing bags and things like that, mitts yeah. and things like that in prisons. The escalation in violence in young offenders now with gang and knife culture. It's out of control, right? The media is not reporting and giving you a true story of what is going on in the UK at the minute. For anyone that watches Scar City Studios, take a look. That will give you some sort of idea about how high the level of violence is with these young offenders dying in the streets. Yeah. It's every other fucking day. Every other day, a child is dying through gang violence. But you can't have a boxing bag in a gym because it promotes violence. They're already fucking violent. It can't make it no fucking no. worse, but they won't introduce it. They, See, they don't like I it. honestly believe, Tom, if, you, if they brought boxing classes and stuff like that into prisons, I think it would de-escalate the violence. Listen, you know as well as I do, if you went into an MMA gym or a boxing gym and you have a really good session, when you come out of that gym, do you want to fight? Oh, you feel fantastic, mate. You feel, you feel fantastic. tired, but you feel good. Exactly. Now, if you take that away from you, and the anger starts to build up, the anxiety starts to build up. What do you want to do? You want to fucking kill someone. It's like when you haven't been in the gym for three days, you start getting pissed off and angry and snapping at people. And this is it, but, and then you add on to that, you're in a cell for 23 hours a day. Yeah. You add into that, you can't see your family. You add into that, that your girlfriend's pregnant and about to drop the baby and you're banged up. And they're telling you, you can't do that because we don't agree with it. Yeah. You can end up killing someone. This is why there's a record number now of assaults on prison officers. Yeah. They're wondering why they're all getting cracked in the mouth. Well, I can, I can tell them straight away why it's fucking happening. You're not doing enough. The programs that you've yeah. got are shit. None of them are working. There needs to be an overhaul of the entire system. And again, it's something that we're working on as part and parcel of what I've been telling you. And we believe that it starts in the primary schools. So we believe in the last year of primary school, there should be an educational talk and done in a practical manner. So from doing research, it's a well-known fact that if you give a kid a book to read and then you ask them questions about what they've read, they'll probably come back with 65, 70% of the information you request. Now, if you act that scene now, they'll come back with 80%, 90% because they've physically done it and they've absorbed yeah. the information. So for, the idea is, is that we do some sort of role play. So there's a lot of methods that these gangs are using to sort of bring in new young members. And it, there's a lot of tricks. It's sort of like, oh, you want a new pair of trainers? Like, we get that for you. You go and drop this at the house for us. You go and drop it at the house, they get mugged on the way. Right, you've lost my gear, now you owe me fucking money. That's it, you're trapped. Do you know what I mean? It's as simple as that. And I think by acting it out in real life scenarios, they'll absorb the information yeah. more. What made you get into cage fighting, Tom? It was kind of like, um, it was an accident, really. I never, 
I never woke up one day and thought I'm going to be a fighter. I mean, we was always fighting when we was going out here and there, but it was sort of like a lot of people around me were fighting. Um, and when the cage fighting thing started to get a lot bigger, it was people that I knew knew the promoters of the events, and it was like, oh, why don't you have a go? Why don't you have a go? So I started the training. I loved the training. I loved the regimen. I loved the, the way it made me feel. I was very relaxed after a session. Um, and then I started to get offered fights. Um, and I was fighting at UCMMA, which is a big show in London. And the, the buzz you get, I mean, you're walking out in front of a few thousand people and you're knocking someone out, yeah. it's fucking brilliant. There ain't no feeling like it. But for me, you have to be realistic with it. Um, was I a Jimmy Manoa? No, I wasn't. So you have to be real with yourself. Um, I, at the time I was fighting, I was about 23, 24. Um, I started to get really bad knees. I was getting a lot of water retention in my knees. Um, so you have to start wearing up can I make it to the UFC? Yeah. Can I make it to Bama? And if you're honest with yourself, be, if I'd have had the correct training, maybe. But would I have been a champion? I doubt it. So yeah. I preferred to go another route. For yeah. me, it was, it was an experience. I loved it. I still train now. Um, I, like I say, I love the regiment of it. But realistically, I think my, my energy is best suited in other areas. Tony's rise to fame on Britain Behind Bars was a positive step especially for Tony to finally get his message across that crime doesn't pay. The fact that the prison system had Tony as a mediator between staff and the prisoners showed how high Tony was regarded in the prison system and also his reputation respected. When did you start realising, Tom, that you, were, you, were, you had a reputation? Because like you say, other people give you it, you don't go out and get it. But when did you realise yourself that you have that reputation? When you stop getting invited to places. Because, I mean, it's the same thing I say to my kids now. It starts off as a kid, something stupid. You go around your mate's house and you nick his jumper. Or you round your like, mate's mate's house, you nick a jumper. All of a sudden, the mum and dad are like, don't have him around here. Yeah. And it, that's how it starts. And when you get older, um, it, it's done in a lot more subtle ways. So, for instance, there's a boys' holiday going on. Everyone's ringing around inviting everyone, but you ain't invited. Yeah. Why ain't you invited? Because they can't be fucked to go out and you cramp someone <laughs> fucking, and ruin the holiday. Yeah. So it's easier just not to ask her. So that, that's when you sort of notice. But for me, I'm very, I'm very isolated. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't need people's company all the time. I don't need to be around people constantly. I'm quite happy with my own company. As long as I've got things that I'm working on and I'm putting energy into, that's good enough for me. I mean, the days of me going clubbing and going down pubs, they're, they're yeah, behind me. See, I've done that. that. That was a lot, a big section of my life, but it's done now. Yeah. So now I move on to something else. I mean, we're doing the music thing at the minute. We've got a, a group called The Rebellion. Um, I was involved as a, a drum and bass MC from like 16 years old. Um, and I used to go abroad all over the world doing the MC in and we've just kicked that off again and we've got some events coming up, one in Reading um, on the 29th of August uh, with MC Traumatic and MC X-Man headlining it. So again, it's, it's just something else that keeps me occupied. So my aim and my goal is, is that I want to get the acting going, which yeah, I've got yeah, an ample yeah, opportunity yeah. with Victor Dark's thing that's hopefully going to go soon. Um, I've got the music thing going on, I've got my podcast, channel coming out and on top of that I'm working with um, Reliant I'm trying to make these these kids units get up and running and start helping the kids because for me the, the, there's just not enough of it no. and the, the, it's very British it's such a British thing not to give a fuck about other people British people have that attitude of that ain't nothing to do with me so I ain't fucking yeah, interested and... but the problem is when do people stop fucking caring I mean if I go out and I see a kid and he's homeless and he's on the street. It's, a, it's amazing because you're watching hundreds of people walk past. And how many people actually stop and ask that kid, why are you out on the street? Yeah. What's led you to this? You're a child. Let us say the worst place, the worst city, for it, fucking London. Yeah, they're everywhere. Nobody pays yeah. attention to no, the no, 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 stuff, man. Because everyone's after the Range Rover and the Rolex so they can put their fucking things up to TikTok. That's all people are bothered about now. People have just stopped caring. You go back to the First and the Second World War, we, people were on rations, and you would still help your next door neighbour out if yeah. they needed to go. Fuck me, if we had a war now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get out there. Well, you know I mean, look at the look at the craze in the in the sixties and well fifties and sixties. They were helping people. Of course, 
But you don't get that now. Nah, nah. You the, don't get it now. The, the, the old moral code has, has gone. It's disappeared. 100%. It's, it's no longer there. Um, now it's literally, I want, I take. Yeah. And whatever the consequences you get from that, that's what happens. So it's, it's, it's what's made society more dangerous. And you can go back to the Cray era and you think of the government's attitude yeah. towards the Crays and the Richardsons. These menaces have got to be removed from our streets, but that was a bit of a fuck up, wasn't it? Yeah. Because they may have been a menace on their own, but at least you had control of them. Yeah. As soon as they were gone, it was a fucking free for all. And you look at the way that the, the kids are now, was it a positive thing to do? I don't think it was. Yeah. Really like, like you were saying there, Tony, people are walking past kids in the street and not giving a fuck. That's why kids are probably the way they are, because nobody cares. That, but that's the attitude. You don't care about me, so why the fuck do I care about yeah. you? And that's the attitude. And it, it's, it's never going to change unless you start helping them. But because everyone's got this attitude of, I don't, it's not my problem, yeah. it, the, the problem grows in the background. And mark my words, I've said this on every podcast I've been on, in 20 years' time, there will be certain areas of London you can't even fucking walk in. There's certain estates now that the police won't even go on. Do you know what I mean? That's only going to get worse because you're not changing the attitude, the, the way that they're thinking. And until that happens, you're pretty much fucked. I mean, I'll be honest with you, talk. I, I actually witnessed this at the, um, at the Dougie Joyce fight. We, um, this country talks about racism and stuff. I have never seen so much racism towards travellers that yeah. I've ever seen that day. We went to three pubs to go and sit in the pub and, you know, have a pint. Not one pub let them in. Yeah. Wouldn't let them in. Uh, it's a fully booked, you can't come in. Yeah. But this couldn't be yet talked about racing them, but yet towards travellers, I don't give a fuck. But the thing is, that, I mean, the, the, the travelling community, I mean, I mean, I've grown up with them. Um, since I was a young, young kid, I used to go and store and go and drive diggers for my mate Paul. So I've been around the travelling community for many years and they're very loyal and they're very close knit, but they've always been seen as outsiders. And that's the problem they're always going to have is that because they're different and they stick to their moral code, it's like, mm. but again, you have to look at both sides of the argument. Yeah. I've been in pubs with lots of travellers and fights have gone off and when it goes off in a traveller fight in a pub, it goes off. The old place gets smashed up. Now, the same with corruption, you get bad apples. Yeah. In, 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 whether you're Asian, whether you're white, whether you're black, you get bad apples, but the bad apples shouldn't create this stigma no. for everyone else on a whole. Um, and that's the problem with the travelling community. Because you get a few bad apples here and there, it then gives all of them a bad name. But you get that in every aspect of life. 100%, there's good and bad in everybody. Um, but the, 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 the travelling family that I were spending time with are the most respectable people I've ever met. Yeah, Lovely yeah. people, but yet on social media they've been perceived as bad people. Yeah. But yet I take people at face value, yeah. how they treat me. Yeah. And that's how I take people. I don't listen to any like what people say about other people. I always take them myself yeah. and I meet the person, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that a lot of the problem is they won't conform. So the government, the way society has been raised in the last 50 years, the travelling community haven't done that. I mean, you look at Tyson Fury, he says, I will not score my kids because that's the travel away. Yeah. He doesn't want them to become greedy and needy. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't want to give them everything because once you've got everything, what have you got to aim yeah, for? Absolutely nothing. So in that respect, so I agree with him fully. Um, but like I said, I, you get bad ones, you get good ones. The good ones, they're out of this world. Yeah. I mean, I've, 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 I've met the mums, I've met the kids, and they're out there, they're, 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 they're their own characters. Their way of life is unique in itself. And that to me is attractive, because yeah. if everyone was the fucking same, it'd be boring. Yeah. So for me, I think there is a place for the travelling community. I do think they get a lot of stick. But what I will say is you get a few bad apples that create that stigma, um, and it makes it harder for them to retain their history and carry it on. Do you find, Tom, you know, with you helping the kids and that now, do you find it easier to help them because you kind of connect with them because you were like that when you were younger? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was very normal. So, yeah. I mean, when you live in Surrey, there's a lot of the travelling community in Surrey that went to mainstream schools. Yeah. So even when I was in the secondary school, I had two travellers that were in my, in my class. So you sort of learn early on, like, the, the way they talk. So yeah. you learn the kushti and things like this. And mush. All yeah, mush. Oh, mush. Um, so it, for me, it was very normal because I grew up and around that environment. And I would go on to traveller sites, I would go and watch traveller fights, I would go out clubbing with them. Um, and I mean, I had a very, from the age of like 15 to 21, predominantly, 
I hung around in Mosey on the Phil Common estate, and most of the people on there are travellers. Um, and I was around them every day. And I mean, for me, they're, they're, I mean, those families that I used to deal with, I won't name them, but they know who they are. They're very loyal, very loyal. They're, they were there if you needed yeah. them. They was always willing to help if you needed it. Um, but sort of as you get older, the way it is in the travelling community, they're very focused on money, they're building their own yeah. business, supporting their family, being a good role model, being a good dad. Sort of, it makes you split off and everyone sort of goes in their, their own directions. But, I mean, I had a while of the time. I had a while of the time. <laughs> did you ever find torn that? You know you were grown, did you ever find that you had a, did you have a chip on your shoulder? Nah. I mean, everything we'd done, there was a reason for. I didn't wake up one morning and I think, I'm going to go and fucking do this just to annoy him, or I want to wind him up. It wasn't about that. We was interested in money. That was it. So if you had something we wanted, we'd come and take it. Simple as that. And we made sure that when we come, you had, there's nothing you can do about it. We, we didn't care if you had a reputation. We yeah. didn't care if you was in a gang. We didn't care if you was going to do this. We made sure that when we come, we come right. So that no matter what happened, we was taking it. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it. Now, the, the flip side to that is you have to deal with the aftermath. You have to be willing to go the extra mile. You have to be willing to go further than the next person. So, by having a group around you and everyone having that same, that same mentality, um, not a lot of people really wanted to get involved. Not because they couldn't, it was because it weren't worth a fucking headache. It was a good um, So, you sort of lent on that. One thing I liked about Tony was his honesty and the fact he took responsibility for his mistakes. He didn't blame anyone but himself. I suppose this could come with being a product of his own environment. Learning the street ways and the hustle, doing the prison time and becoming a mediator between the prisoners and the staff. I suppose this is how Tony may have learned to accept responsibility. Do you ever take any drugs in your, in your, in your life? Well, of course, of course. I mean, when, you, when you're growing up, you're in and around that environment. Yeah. And if you're, if you're in that life, then drugs are a good part of it. Um, if you ain't robbed them, you take them. Um, it, it was part and parcel of what you were doing. But the hardest thing that I've found with drugs is knowing when to stop. 100%. Because you get to a point where it becomes unenjoyable, but the demand still taken yeah. is there. So it's a very fine line of knowing when to quit and when to, to, to knock it on the air. And that's, that's what I found the most difficult. I mean, for the last few years now, I've done such a fucking thing. Yeah. But, um, and it's the best way. And I've been so much in my head, mentally healthier. Because uh, you don't realise the damage they do to you until you stop fucking taking them. That's, that's where all the problems yeah. come when you stop. Yeah. And then I, I, I bump into these kids now, and it's like, I've got to have a joint. Yeah. It's like, you didn't fucking need a joint before you started taking it. It's why do you need one now? It's like, they, they have this need. It's like, you can't get through the day without it. And it's like, at what point did... Because I remember when I was out of the spit, um, I was with my mate Billy Ogg, uh, funnily enough. He's over at Park. I must have been about 15. And then I had a can of Rio, you know, the truck called Rio. And we're smoking this thing in the thing. And all of a sudden, I, I, I said Rio wrong. I said Rio or something like that. And he started laughing. We couldn't stop fucking laughing. And it was those kind of moments of memories that stick in your head. You never forget them. But eventually, all of a sudden, you're rolling a joint for no reason. It ain't fun no more. No. It's like you're doing it because you need it. And trying to get that message across to the kids. It, it, too much of anything is bad for you. Too much fucking tomato sauce yeah. is fucking bad for you. So it's learning, yes, you're going to go out. Are your kids going to go out and be exposed to drugs? Yes, they are. Will they take them? Probably. But the thing is, you can try stuff, but just in moderation, yeah? Have the experience, knock it on the edge. When you get carried away with something, it becomes harmful. For me, that's the, that's, where, that's your learning curve in life, really. I'm trying something, not liking it, and then you go and take it again, or where some people take it, comes an addiction, yeah. you're doing it for the next 20 years. Yeah, what's the same with alcohol? Someone has a bad alcohol, I've got a drink. Do you know, is the drink fixing the problem? Yeah, yeah. Of course you fucking ain't. It's just masking it and yeah. smoking over it. So, for me, you're better off dealing with your problems head on, Get the right on if you need it. Yeah. Um, I go about it the right way. Because when you're taking all these drugs and not drinking alcohol, all you're doing is masking over the problem. You're not solving it. 
Um, and as soon as you come down off the drink or you come down off the drugs, that problem is still going to be there. 100%. So and the idea is you want to get rid of that fucking problem. So address it the right way, get the right help, do it properly. See, I think, I don't know whether you agree, Tron, I think addiction, it's a mental thing, mate. It's all mental. People say it's a physical thing, but for me, You've got yourself in that mess, you can get yourself out of that mess. It's just all mental, mate. Listen, no one born taking no. fucking drugs, are they? I mean, you get these fucking old crack babies and things like that, but even them kids don't get to the age of four and think, oh, I've got to do a pipe. Do you know what I mean? So, it's, the, it's the, the people, again, that you're around. I had friends that didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't do nothing, and then they ended up on heroin. Now, I never ended up on that shit, but so how did you end up in it? You was in yeah. my circle. So how did you, and not only that, you ended up on it without me knowing. Yeah. Because that, in that world, it's very secretive. People don't want to advertise the fact they're on hard drugs. It's all kept secret behind closed doors. And that in itself creates a problem, because if no one knows about it, no one can try and help you. And then by the time you realise there's a problem, it's too late, they're hooked on it. So if you're around people, no matter what kind of friends they are, if you're in a group of people and someone said, oh, I've done this last night, if you know in yourself it's bad, Exactly what I said at the start of the podcast. If it's a fucking bad cancer in your life, cut it out. If you can see it leading to further problems in the future, get rid of it, cut yeah. it out. You've got no excuse after that. If you keep that in your life and that starts affecting your life, that's your fault. No one else. Yeah, so you, you've got to get rid of it. If it's negative, get rid of it. Yeah, did you ever find Tom when you took drugs? Did you ever use him to, to, to mask problems and stuff? Nah, see, for me it was. Um, it was more, see, with the drum and bass raving, when we was kids, we used to go to places like Stratford Rex Baggies. Yeah. And um, so a lot of it was like pills and things like that. The, the harder drugs, because again, I was in the environment, you don't go to a rave where someone's doing everything, because no, it's no, the wrong no, place yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was never exposed to it in that way. But this is why it's hard for kids now, because as these kids are growing up, they're all getting into different things, whether it's football or when they're going to the gym. If you go to the gym, what drug do you most likely come into contact with? Steroids. Because it's, it's part of that environment. If you're going into a dingy little fucking squat rave right, in fucking London, it, you, you might see people taking crack, you might see people yeah, taking heroin. Yeah. So it's all about the environment that you put yourself yeah. in. If you've got that mental attitude now, and I hope you have as a kid, if, you, if you're getting to the age of 14, 15, 16, and so far you've managed to say, I don't want to smoke weed, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do coke. If you've managed to get that far, just make sure that the people that you surround yourself with have all got the same fucking attitude yeah. as you. Because if they have, you're going to go far. You'll skip all of that bullshit out. And mark my words, I was told as a young man by my sister, and I remember it clear as a bell, that she said in the next 20 years, one of your best friends will die, or someone close to you will die, someone will be addicted to drugs, and people will get burned off in prison. All fucking three have happened. So if you make the right choices, even though you're making the right choices, you will see other yeah. people that have been around you that haven't been as intelligent as you start to go down the wrong road. But as yeah. long as it's not you, that's where you move yourself I, I mean, I've never heard that one before, Tone, where normally with heroin, people will dabble with other things before they go on to heroin. Yeah. I've never really known people just to jump straight onto heroin straight yeah, away, but, you know what I mean? But it's the thing, I mean, I started offending because the group of people I was with, we was all obsessed with motorbikes. Yeah. It was motocross and superbikes. So because I'm constantly, every single day, with a group of 10 people going, we need a motorbike, we need a motorbike, we're going to go out to your fucking motorbike. And because you're part of that clique, that's what you're going to end up doing. Now, if you take that scenario and you end up going with one of your mates that you trust to a house, everyone's doing their own. Yeah. You can only stay in that environment for fucking so long before you're going to try. It. Yeah. 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 So, again, product your own environment. Do you never find, Tom, that a lot of mate, kids nowadays not find a lot of them watch too many gangster movies? I don't think, I've, I have not got this perception that, I mean, I remember the government saying when Grand Theft Auto come out, everyone's going to be stealing cars and ripping. Listen, a lot of rappers and a lot of MCs, they have alter egos. Yeah. So even though you get people like 50 Cent or Eminem rapping about their real yeah. lives, a lot of the stuff they say is for dramatisation. Yeah. It's to make a catchy lyric to get you hooked to buy the single. That's the aim. So from that aspect of it, you can look at films the same way. People act stuff out on camera so that you will watch it for profit. That's the whole idea. If it was fucking boring, you wouldn't watch it, you wouldn't listen to it. The problem I've got is that when you start to mix the two, so now we've got people making drill gang videos about people 
they've actually fucking stabbed. Yeah. Now, I ain't fucking Einstein, but if I've stabbed someone, I'm not telling no one, let alone putting myself on camera and singing about it. But this is what we're working with now. It goes back to what I was saying about being, like having possessions. It's views, I need views, I need clicks. I need something to tell me that I'm different from everyone else and that I'm special. And I can do that by getting 1.3 million views. Yeah. And then they're sort of getting their head right, I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna get a record deal. You ain't gonna get a record deal because you fucking stab someone. What record label's gonna want you? Yeah, yeah. But they're so fixated on that route. And I don't think that music artists now do enough to show you the way forward. So you look at people like Dizzy Rascal, Dizzy Rascal does do quite a bit. Yeah. But for me, it needs to be made a lot clearer on, if you do this, this will lead to this. Yeah. This will then lead to this, this will then lead to this. And show the path that they need to take. A lot of the kids, they don't know. And when you're putting on YouTube and they're watching these videos, then they think that's the way forward. Yeah, yeah. That's what we've got to do. So now it's like, I'm in a group. We haven't got any problems for anyone, but now we need to create a problem. Yeah. We need this beef because it will make good viewing. Whereas before it was for dramatisation. Whatever happened to getting two gangs together that got on, let's pretend to have a beef. 100%. It's the exact same fucking outcome apart from at the end, you ain't killing each other. On camera, it's still going to look the same, but trying to convince them that this is hard work. Do you ever find taunts? Do you know what? And this is a fact. This social media is all now about how many views and followers somebody can get. Of course it is. And I'm, I'm, I mean, everyone's guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. You, you put a video up, you, you want to see it do yeah. well. Um, the problem is the content. It's when when you cross that line, when it, and it's it's no longer entertaining, and it's you're going for that shock factor. Um, it's like I see a lot of stuff with animals, people being cruel to animals yeah. and things like that. And it's like I'd rather the fucking animal be happy. Yeah. Don't like, fuck your views. Like and it's the same with kids and these gangs and stuff you see on them. I would rather. Go to a festival, see all these fucking kids going, yeah, you live there, I live here, but fuck it, let's have a good yeah, time. Yeah. yeah? Let's not worry about fucking someone getting a phone call to say their son or their daughter should be fucking killed. Let's just have a good time and let's go on. It do not happen no more because the conflict creates good viewing. 100%. Good viewing creates views. So it's a vicious circle. And until we bring that education back and we change 100%. the mindset of them, it's going to continue to get yeah. worse. You know what I've noticed, especially with doing this podcast tour, everybody loves controversy. Right? You post something up on social media, positive, influential, doesn't get as many likes. You post drama, yeah. fight and argument, it's getting millions of views. And it is, it is. It's sort of, you're losing the focus of your goals. Yeah. So my goal at the minute is to be successful in everything I'm doing. What I ain't going to come on here is go, Andy Joshua, you're a cunt, I want to fight you. Do you know, just to get the views, it don't make sense. Yeah. If you're going to do it, do it the right way. Do you know what I mean? It, but because people want to create that conflict, because it brings in the views, people aren't thinking about what they're saying. And when you don't think about what you're saying, the person that watches it might take it the complete wrong way. Yeah. Hold on, who's this brick? I'm going to have to do something about this. And the next thing, you're getting jerked when you're getting yeah. shot. 100%. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So people need to think more about what they're doing. See, I do notice, Tom. I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware of everything, especially with social media, especially with doing this podcast. A lot of people that do want, they'll try to be famous, mate. A lot of people are. Yeah. They'll, go, they'll do the, they'll do things outside the box, the crazy things that nobody else would do, yeah. just to become famous. I mean, I'm looking at these. Um, I see a lot of videos of people running outside buildings, yeah, fuck jumping on fucking. Like, what the fuck for? Like, don't get me wrong, it looks the box, and I'm watching it, and I'm, I'm liking okay. it. But at the same time, you fall off. What have you died for? Yeah. Fucking views. Yeah. Like, but this is the mentality. People are more interested about how other people perceive them than how they actually perceive themselves. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. What do you think, where do you see yourself now, on in the next three years? What's your, what's your plan of attack? So we're, we're, we're on a five year plan at the moment, um, and we're two years in, and we're actually in front of where we thought we would be. Yeah. Um, so the acting stuff is all coming together. We had a, a big meeting up in um, Kensington the other day. Um, that's looking really promising. I've got the documentary uh, with Jamie Batten. That's looking all very promising now that COVID restrictions have all been lifted. Um, the music stuff is going fucking again brilliant. Uh, big shout out to everyone at Rebellion, X Man, Traumatic. Um, so, yes, it's, I'm going in the right direction. But the thing is, I keep myself to myself. 
I do the work in the background and then you reap the, yeah, the rewards yeah. later. Do you know what I mean? I'm not one of these people that's going to go, I'm fucking doing this. Yeah, yeah. I'm not fucking interested. I, I want to be a good role model for my kids. I want to be a good partner to my, my girlfriend. I want to be a good son to my family. That's, that's, that's my priorities. I don't give a fuck what anyone else thinks. Yeah. It, it don't interest me. Um, some people watch the podcast, they like them. I mean, I've got people in Australia sending me text messages saying how much they like the podcast. Yeah. And for me, that's brilliant. If you can take something positive away from what I'm saying, I think that's fucking amazing. What's your podcast called for the people watching, Tom? So it will be the Tony Gooch podcast. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're all set to go. We're probably about three weeks out. We've got some really good guests lined up. Um, so yeah, stay tuned yeah. and keep an eye on the channel. If you go on to YouTube, Tony Gooch, it'll come straight yeah. up. Go and subscribe to him, guys, and get ready for some good content. Um, like I say, Tom, very inspirational guy you are. Um, I mean, to go, come from what you have been to where you are now, mate, is a massive achievement. But it's just intelligence. Yeah. Could I have carried on what I was doing to this day? The answer is yes. But where would I be? And the, the, the problem that you can't stress to these kids is you're putting all of this money in, but because it's quick, easy money, it goes out just as fast. Yeah. You don't really end up doing fucking money. So you need to get the other way said your bread and butter. So with me, I qualify myself from driving the big lorries, the big Arctic. So I always had a, a means of income. A lot of these kids have got nothing. Yeah. They literally, their whole life is crying. And it's like, it's sad because they can be so much more if they just believed in themselves. And the role models that they're picking, it's no longer a Muhammad Ali. It's no longer a Lennox Lewis. It's, they're, they're not looking up to people and thinking, that's me, I want to be that person. Yeah. Now, it's, I want to be Dave in the tower block that shot three ounces of gear a month because he's, he's life yeah. is the bollocks. No it ain't, his life's fucking shit. His life is shit, he's going fucking nowhere. He's gonna end up getting nicked. And this is the thing with crime. If you're an active criminal, it might come as a bit of a shock to people. You're going to prison. There ain't no, oh it won't happen to me or I'm too clever and the police say, if you're an active criminal on a day to day basis, you are going to prison. Yeah. It's simple as fucking that. The house always wins. You have to be lucky every single fucking day. The old bill have to be lucky once. Yeah. It's a law of fucking averages. You are going to go to prison. From then, where do you go from there? Because now you've got a criminal yeah. record. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Is they just need to think. They, I want kids to have goals again. I want them to be inspired by people. I want them to go out and just fucking believe in themselves and they can be better. It's like my kids. I've got two boys, but uh, one 13, one 11. Please and thank you. Simple things. If my kid don't say please or thank you, I'm flopping it up the head. It's as simple as that. I won't have it. Because the manners in this life are everything. And I believe it's got to that point now. You've got fucking the government saying, ah, oh, you can't do this to a child. You can't even shout at a fucking child because it's a form of abuse. Your fucking way has now created this generation of kids with the attitudes they've got. So you was fucking wrong. And we need to go back to where I was. Because when I was a kid, even though I was committing offences, if I see a police officer, there was always that level of fear. You could get a hide enough to gather us. You could get put in the back of the fucking van and wade in. It was always a possibility. Yeah. I'm now walking and seeing kids going, fuck you. That fear is gone. Yeah. And when that fear went, they was on down the spiral yeah. because they're no longer an authority. They're a joke. The police force now are a fucking joke. The only way that kids actually respect the police is when you've got fucking flying squad. 100%. Or, do you know what I mean? Or a proper squad on that. But yeah, the normal yeah. Bobby has lost all of yeah, his yeah. reputation. And I think you need to get that back. But how they do that is going to be very, very difficult. Do you think, Tony, if you'd have stayed in crime, do you think you'd have ended up dead? Listen, the, the rate we was going at, you, you've got three possibilities. You're going to die, you're going to get lifed off, or you're going to end up a millionaire. I hate yeah. to say it, but the millionaire thing is very rare. And this is another thing that kids don't understand. I was actively involved in crime every fucking day from a kid up to probably about 25, 26, yeah. then I started working. I can count on one fucking hand how many people have been successful and now live the life of Riley. The odds are, you better off going by a lot of tickets. Have you ever met, I mean, it's very, do, have you ever met a retired rich gangster? Yeah, yeah. I very do. rare though. Yeah, I do. But even, even though they've done well at crime, they no longer participate in yeah. crime. They've even got the sense, look, we've been fucking lucky enough to make this done. Yeah, yeah. We're knocking everything on the end now. Now they do legitimate things with the money. 
And that, that goes back generations. Yeah. If you look at most big corporations in London, they was all fucking built with bent money. A lot, a lot of them are. It's how a lot of them start. But if you're selling an eighth of weed, or you're selling a couple of packs of gear, or you're going out and robbing someone for a mobile phone, or you're going to rob a bro, it's not constant. Do you know what I mean? It only lasts for so long before you get nicked. Once you start getting nicked, you're on the police's radar. Yeah. The people I know that have done well have never even been arrested, let alone convicted. So the other way got a fucking clue that they are, and now they've got ways and means to cover up the, 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 the money that they've gained through, through legal businesses. But if you're a kid and you're living on a council estate and you're waking up in the morning and you're thinking, I fucking hate my life. I'm fucking smoking an ounce of fucking weed every single week. My mum don't give a fuck, my dad don't give a fuck. These aren't reasons for you to go out and start doing things wrong. This should give you a kick up the fucking ass to sit there on your bed and think, I ain't gonna fucking live like this. Yeah. I ain't gonna fucking end up like this. I'm gonna fucking do something about it. Get out there, educate yourself, get yourself a decent fucking job, which you can do. You learn the money anyway. You ain't gotta be looking over your shoulder. Tony is a prime example of how to change your life. From gang life to spending time in the prison system, to then using his street smart mindset and his fearsome reputation to control tough situations with out of control prisoners. My conclusion on Tony, that he's a genuine hard man. I'm a fighting man myself, so I know all about what it's like to carry a reputation. Tony's put his to good use and now uses his knowledge from not just his time in prison but his days on the streets by helping kids turn their lives around and putting something back into society. If you've anything to say to people watching this now Tony before we finish up, what would it be? Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself, have faith in yourself. Nothing is impossible. If you're a kid and you're watching me now, pull your finger out your ass, get rid of all that bullshit and cut it out, go and get yourself into college, go and get yourself into university and do something about your life. If you can't get into college or into university, go and find something legal and be the best at it that you can. You can do it and I know you can do it, so I just want to see more people making a success of themselves. Well, you've heard it from a man that's worn the t-shirt, he's done it and he's changed his life, Tony Gooch. Thank you, Thank you very you much for coming, brother. Thank you very much, my brother. My name's Decker Heggie, and I'll see you on the next episode of the Official All or Nothing podcast. God bless.